In 2019, the BIG initiative ran six clinics across Canada, uh, helping to support women and non-binary folks in creating root setting opportunities, whether that's as a job uh, or, or just as something that climbers enjoy. And coming into 2020, that was all set to expand with, I think, 10 clinics. Uh, of course, that's all been put on hold now because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But it's a great time to reflect on how the first season went and what might come up in the future. So with me today, I have the founder of the BIG initiative, jean vivre de Laplante from Montreal and Flannery Shane Nemero, uh, the instructor for the last season, joining us from Arizona. Thank you both very much for uh, for taking some time today. Thanks for having us. <laughs> so I want to start out uh, with uh, something that was written on the blog for your website, and I think it's just a good starting point for why something like this makes sense. Uh, so you wrote in a blog post, uh, while there is no one reason for which there are fewer women than men in setting, when the number is equal or close to equal, one thing does stand out. The difference in those cases is that there was a deliberate search for women who want to set. Uh, let's use that as a jumping off point as to why uh, you thought this was something that was really important to you to get started. Um, so one of the <laughs> one of the things that gets brought up when uh, we talk about hiring more women for setting either in my own businesses or stuff I've heard uh, others say is uh, that they don't receive applications from women or from uh, non-binary non -binary individuals to uh, applying for root setting jobs. Um, and I think that if you want, basically the idea was to me is if you want to show women that you want them in your setting crew or that there are opportunities for them, you have to go tell them and find them. And the gyms that, you know, there are gyms that I've seen who deliberately go out and, 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 uh, talk to women in their community and uh, and non-binary non-binary folks and, and to find out you know to tell them that they're hiring or to give them opportunities either in forerunning or to starting in forerunning and then and then ultimately in uh, like apprenticeships etc. So um, I think if we want to see change, we have to take deliberate action and not just wait for things to happen. For yourself, you're somebody that's been working in climbing and, and of course you're a owner of a, of a couple of gyms in Canada. Um, how much of that was a reflection on just the experience you saw in Canada, like, uh, or, or in your neighborhoods when, you know, I don't think you were doing probably the hands-on root setting, uh, hiring yourself. Um, but, uh, was that kind of just something you were seeing in, 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 in kind of your own operations? And did you ever feel like you figured out a way to handle that within your own gyms until this came up? Um, We've definitely over, you know, yeah, it's been, I've been in the business for about 17 years and uh, more actively in the last, I say, uh, 12. And I think that, that I've seen, in, obviously, in my own businesses, but even in other gyms, like talking to other owners, um, there are women who want to set and we, you know, they'll get training. Like we used to have uh, three or four women on our setting teams a few years ago, but once they, they left, um, it was hard to find other women who had experience and who could uh, take their place. So uh, that, you know, uh, or they would get hired by another gym or like move or change careers. And, um, and then, and it's, I mean, root setting is a hard job to get into for anyone. <laughs> it's like for men, the, the, path, the entry point is unclear to begin with. Um, and so uh, in, in the, our decision to create the big initiative, um, it, it was basically after a discussion, John Mack and I said, like, if we want women on the team, we're just going to have to do a workshop and, and train only women and see who's interested. And then I, uh, Alexa, Leia, Sophie and I took that a step further and we were like, well, why don't we just do it across Canada <laughs> and tell more women even. <laughs> like, why just do it in one city? Do it for everyone. Um, so, yeah. All right. So if you have this problem, you identify and you decide you're going to create this initiative. What did you feel like the, uh, these uh, people would need to take away from a clinic that would actually give them an opportunity to get into the industry? What did you have to give them? Um, so I think that the we wanted to make sure that there were we made no assumptions about any knowledge they did have. Um, we when I spoke to Plannery initially about creating the program, we wanted to start with just like basic use of the drill. What are all the 
parts that you need to know about, like the bits and the and the bolts and like the different types of tools involved. And then the basics of putting, uh, I mean, if you're going to do a workshop, you have to start at the beginning. You have to like start at the very, very beginning. Um, because I think that the tools was one of the things that, again, not just women or non-binary folks, but anyone in setting, not like a lot of guys also don't have that experience. Um, so so uh, I think coming into a team and, and, and at least feeling confident with the drill and with all of the tools was the one major uh obstacle uh or like piece of information that they need to know and then how to handle all the holes and like the basics of putting up a boulder yeah so just give them a start so that then they can work on the maybe the more um creative aspects of, of root setting i think flannery can probably add to that too because she's definitely <laughs> yeah, before we switch over to Flannery, I, I, the, one other question was uh, that you did end up in this first season doing clinics for, for like people brand new to setting yes. and also a separate uh, pair of classes that were targeted to people that had some experience. Um, when, when did you discover that that was something you might need to provide? Uh, very quickly. When we started, when, when I started, well, together, when we all brainstormed the the idea of the, the workshops, we realized that there are already women who are studying in Canada, obviously, like and, and some that we know, but once in the door, um, we, we there are potentially sometimes less opportunities for um, women and non-binary folks to maybe set in a comp or like get more development. And that's another part, like reinforcing and empowering those uh, that like the knowledge of, of those and the skills of those individuals is really key because we don't want just to, we don't want to have just like a token woman on working on a team. We want to develop them so that they can like, you know, reach higher levels of setting and one day, you know, set a nationals comp or, you know, so it's a, it's a, it's a multi-layered process. <laughs> cool. uh, Flannery, when you got brought in on this, uh, you must have been thinking about probably your own experience and the experience of lots of people you've worked with. Um, you know, what, uh, um, what what were you feeling and, and what did you feel was really relevant to you as you started getting involved in this initiative? That's a good question. Um, yeah, initially I was, I don't know, I've had a lot of like levels of involvement with like activism, quote unquote activism and road setting. Um, over the years and done like lots of women's comps and the thing I always come away with is just like exposing more people to root setting is what it's going to take for root setting to become better right so these big initiative workshops have been really good for just exposing like huge numbers of I mean huge relatively but like huge numbers of women and non-binary folks to the act of root setting and not all those not all of those people are going to come away with like thinking that root setting is a career that they really want but everyone's going to come away with the idea that they could be root setters, or at least that's the goal. Um, so that was something I was really interested in. Just coming from, from a high level of root setting and seeing so few women and, and no one who, yeah, really, like, is breaking those boundaries in the States as much. Um, it was really cool to be involved in the big initiative. Uh, as you started piecing together what you were going to teach and how you were going to do this, I, I know you've ran pretty much all the way to the top of the USA climbing uh, setting hierarchy. Um, you know, what, it, we'll use that as a reference point. What, um, how, how does it compare to like a level one or a level two clinic in terms of your areas of focus and the participants in the clinics? So it's a little bit different. Honestly, I've, I didn't take the level one clinic, so I can't compare it directly. How'd you get away um, with that? <laughs> years and years of luck. All right. Just repeatedly. Um, but basically what we're doing is starting even before the level one clinic would start. Um, so a lot of what Jen was saying is is exactly right. Like we're trying to start from the beginning and not take any assumptions about what people may or may not know. Um, because that's a that's a big barrier to women in root setting. Like traditionally or more regularly, people who are socialized male have exposure to tools and ladders. And just the terminology of like, what is a bolt? What is a nut? What is a drill? Stuff like that. And that's that whether or not people admit to it is a really big barrier to entry when they're applying for a job where you have to have that knowledge. 
So we start right at the beginning, like how to use a ladder safely. Whereas in the USAC, like level one clinic, um, you're starting a little bit more from like, do you have the do you have the tools? Do you have the knowledge? Let's see about how to how to force movement. Um, for the advanced setting clinics, we're starting. They look a little bit like a level two clinic for sure. Um, it's a little bit more like setting for a specific group. So we'll hypothetically be setting for like youth climbers or hypothetically be setting for an event. And then we'll forerun as if we were in that process. And, and it'll be a little bit more like setting for a climbing competition generally. So there's some, some comparisons to be drawn for sure, though it's not the same across the board. All right, let's, let's talk, talk about the, the well, for the most part, part, as we go through this, we'll talk about the, uh, the clinic for the beginners. I think that's the most, like, uh, interesting one um, in terms of, like, how you teach it and, and what gets taught. So uh, I, I, this is a good point for full disclosure. My paycheck mostly gets signed off on by jean Biev's brother, so just just in case anybody is bothered by that. Uh, but I also work at one of the gyms that hosted uh, uh, one of these clinics, so I kind of got to see just from the outskirts how things were running. Uh, first of all, one, one thing is that, like it was a fairly large group of people in these clinics. Um, and so I noticed that you guys integrated uh, staff members from each facility as you guys toured around to kind of help out with teaching. Um, so what was that role like? And I, I kind of quickly discovered that that was almost a, a, a at, At first, first I, I, I was kind of like, oh, you need one of our staff to help you do this clinic. Like, that's pulling away from our operations and all this kind of stuff. But it really quickly became obvious that it was it was a benefit to, to the staff on our team that got a chance to do that because they were taken as autonomous people and introduced as being part of uh, teaching staff, which, at least in our case, probably hadn't been something that they'd done before. Um, I'm not going to ask, like, was that part of the plan or whatever, but the question more is, what was the actual teaching team for each of these clinics? Because I know, it, Flannery, it wasn't just yourself. Um, so it was it was me, and I was, like, jumping between all the gyms, and then we'd always have someone else as, like, an intern position. Um, all of that was to give, to give someone either a member of the gym staff who'd been studying for a while, or someone else in the community who'd had that setting experience. Both the opportunity to um, teach and expose their own knowledge, but also to learn from me in some extent about how to teach that clinic in the future. Because the ultimate goal is that I don't teach them forever, right? <laughs> it's, so that it's that this knowledge is disseminated amongst the population that can teach, teach themselves and teach, teach each other. So. Cool. Um, jean as for, uh, for most of last season, uh, most of the gyms are gyms that you're very closely tied to. Uh, and so it was probably a, a different process of, of getting hosts for these events. Um, and also probably just a good first run, right, is, is, uh, is getting your feet wet, figuring out how it all works. Um, as you went around this, this, uh, this new year of programming, as you were reaching out to facilities, um, I know from last year, some facilities were already reaching out to you guys wanting to host something. Uh, but what were you having to uh, provide to these facilities in exchange for, for getting your program in their doors? Um, the exchange has been just visibility, I guess, uh, through our networks and their, and their own efforts at basically building events around the, around the setting. Um, we've, the, the way we've done it is that we set up an application process for gyms to apply to host one. And we set the, um, we set the right away. We like put up a list of what, what we need after like the one year that we've done, you know, there are things that we definitely know that we need. <laughs> um, like drills. Drills. Yeah. <laughs> Ladders. Yeah. Yeah, um, and it's been an exchange. And I think that, We've not had to, you know, we want to work with people who want to work with us. So what we found this year was that we didn't have to twist anyone's arm. There are gyms that want to host a big initiative workshop um, at their gyms. And as long as everyone knows, like, up front what's expected of each other, then, we, you know, the, it's been great. Like, we, you know, the, what what the gym benefits from basically is, like, a full set that, and, we'll, you know, we'll hire the instructor. We take care of, like a lot of the logistics and everything and we just need the space so the it's honestly it's it's been so far it's been even with because this year we've had none of the gyms that i'm tied like closely affiliated to um be a part of the network so it's all like new gyms um that are you know 
that I don't know anyone. I don't hire anyone. <laughs> so, and, and everyone's been just like really enthusiastic. And uh, uh, so that we don't, you know, there's no, uh, we don't have to, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to say we just there's no real exchange other than just like agreeing to do this together and you know putting all our cards on the table of what we can give and what they can give so okay. that's been good yeah so after last season um i'd just love to hear a bit about uh your expectations of the people that came out and wanted to do this clinic and and how they progressed through it if you felt that they were getting from it what you wanted so first part of that is when you're actually doing the setting um and it looked like for the most part uh, you were always doing bouldering at these stops and a couple of them you did some rope setting was that the understanding yeah so so mostly just focusing on bouldering um uh, what were the end results for a lot of these these projects? Uh, you know, when there was a, a setup, you guys would mark the problem so that it was clear that, hey, these were set by big initiative setters. Uh, so a good like promo piece, but also just making clear like, hey, if these climbs feel different, it's because these aren't the uh, the usual setters. Uh, what was the feedback you were getting from gyms about those sets? Like it's, it's really rough to have your first couple boulders you've ever set then be like prime product uh, at any gym because people just don't like stuff that's different. But how did that process go um well it was a lot of i think after many of the workshops after all the workshops the the participants sat around and like watched the like in, people climb their boulders and um first of all that was i think a really surreal experience for a lot of them they felt like a tremendous amount of pride at that like gyms that are you know like really prominent gyms too like I ended up and you know Joe Rockheads is like a <laughs> like a an institution in Toronto and, and to have their boulders be at uh, well and at, at any gym you know where somebody is paying to climb and, and and they're climbing the thing that you created and um the feedback from the gyms was that you know it was a very different set <laughs> from what the, the the clients are used to but in hearing some of the reactions I think that that was um it was welcome you know uh we have like in my own direct experience a, a lot of you know clients who's women who would say you know this is you know more in my 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 range or this is you know tapping into some skills that i have that maybe somebody else next to me doesn't have and i've not experienced this it was just a different a different um type of of setting um uh, in each gym and i think that that like what that has taught me just because we're on that subject is as a as a gym owner my experience has been that like diversity of the offer is really really important and sometimes you know like it's often the same teams that set within a gym um and the importance then if that one team is going to be always there to have like very very different setting styles so that you 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 reach more clients like this is such a huge and i think the big initiative like definitely demonstrated that in, in most of the gym in all the gyms that we we set out the boulders were so different and it was it was a pleasant it was like very welcome i think uh, not because not to say anything about the setting that was there before it's just that it was different so <laughs> i don't know if Lani, you have something else to <laughs> yeah i think that um, um Definitely the gyms felt different afterwards and different people were succeeding in different ways on, on boulder problems and difficulties that they hadn't seen before. And that's not because like the grading was different because a lot of the stuff we, we left ungraded, but just because a variety of setters yeah, leads a variety of people to be able to succeed on those boulder problems. If you change the playing field, like different people are going to do better and different people are going to do maybe not, not as good. Um, so that was super interesting to watch. I haven't heard back from many of the gyms specifically, but just from watching climbers and clients like come in and, and climb on the boulders, like it was a it was a really good response across the board. How did you contextualize that for for the for the root setters? Because you know, the the first couple sets you ever do, the feedback you get from that is is like a high level hard drug in how it hits you. You know, if you get criticism on your first couple of boulders, you're just gonna kill yourself. And if you get in, you know, great feedback, it's something that that you know can occasionally just like inflate your ego in a way that's not entirely reasonable, right? Um, so, how did you talk about that with the with the root setters? Oftentimes, the first line of the clinic was something along the lines of "You are going to suck at this." Like this is your first time doing it, maybe this is your second time doing it, maybe you've been doing it for a year, chances are you're not yet good enough to like 
expect a lot out of yourself. So going into the clinic with that perspective, like I just want you to come in, try your best, fail publicly. And at the end of the day, like hopefully you've learned something. The, the quality of the boulders on the wall is completely irrelevant to both me and your learning experience. And just coming back to that every time a new skill is learned. Like, listen, this doesn't matter. You're not going to be great at it right off the bat. But just, just learn, pay attention, ask questions. And that's like the most you can ask to get out of it. Uh, as, as I was kind of like walking through the gym and, and listening to conversations, uh, you weren't just talking about the skills of root setting. I also heard every once in a while there would be these conversations about how to navigate working as a root setter, which is not a conversation I was ever given uh, as somebody coming up. It was never addressed when I went to a USA setting clinic. Um, can you talk about you know what the questions were that were being asked by the root setters, but also what kind of feedback you had for them as they were about to try and enter this industry? Yeah, so there are a lot of questions um, that kind of range from how does the experience of a root setter work generally and then how does the experience of a female root setter or non-binary root setter work specifically um so some of those questions would be like what are the next steps i take in order to progress my route setting career um and answers to that would also vary uh it depends a lot on the community you're starting in so if there are small gyms that you can start setting in that um maybe will offer work in exchange like for a membership or something um it's a little bit easier to get into those than it would be big gyms but with the important thing that you should never work for free or never work for less than you're like worth. Um, to more specific answers about like what it's like to be a woman in the climbing industry. So how do you deal with sexism? How do you, how do you work with groups of men? What does it look like to four on boulders that are harder than what you can climb? And all those answers would, would also get pretty specific probably. Um, so how do you deal with sexism? Like, it, honestly, it kind of depends on the situation, depends on the amount of like safety and, and confidence and yeah comfort you have in a situation and like how do you forerun boulder problems that are outside of your ability like well here are some things you can do stuff like that um but yeah like lots of questions and i was really trying to give a workshop that encompassed all of those aspects not just like here's how you use a drill here's how you set a dyno stuff like that but like here yeah. are ways in which the route setting industry works and here are ways that you can use that to like further your own career I'd love to get more specific on on just the questions of, you know, let's say you've got a couple guys that climb at the gym and a couple women that climb in the gym and they've all had some opportunity to, to like turn some wrenches in the past. They've all forerun and they're all friends with root setters. Maybe they all have a home wall. How do you like, you know, if you then put the men and the women both like applying for one particular root setting job, what we're all aware of is that most often it is one of the men that will get hired for it. So how, you know, are there, are there ways that you suggest presenting yourself or, or ways that you suggest emphasizing certain parts about your contribution to help you get noticed or get acknowledged? Um, what's you're, you're, you're fighting an uphill battle already. So what are, what are those things that, that you guys have suggested to help with that? You guys start this off on this one often or you want me to go? You can go. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, it totally is an uphill battle. And that's that's the thing is that there's like institutionalized sexism in the root setting industry and the climbing industry and the outdoor industry, so on and so forth. Um, so what do you do to get yourself noticed? First, like playing to your strengths, right? So saying that you do or one would like offer um, a more diverse round of setting in the team and saying that you're like a good or one could be like a good um, indicator of height or reachiness, which are both problems that, that plague almost every climbing gym. And then just like speaking of the things that you're good at. So like adding, you know, women tend to be a little bit more flexible, not myself and not many other female root setters, but <laughs> generally tend to be a little bit more flexible. So, so mentioning stuff like that and really setting yourself apart, not for the reasons that, that like maybe traditional or not traditionally, but commonly like weaker than the men in terms of climbing. Um, but saying like, yeah, more flexible, better at setting these other styles that are usually underrepresented in the gym. Mentioning like problems that you've seen and ways that you see to fix that, stuff like that. But it is it is really a challenge in order to do that. And and also just like diversity within the setting team is going to result in diversity in the gym. And that's a boon for everybody all the time. Javier, did you want to add any thoughts to that? Um. Yeah, I guess as as like a a gym 
a guy from the other from the other side of potentially the hiring process that that definitely um i mean i wouldn't need to be convinced obviously (laughs) but like you know things that i think everything that flannery said is is uh is true and also just you know to just to reinforce the part where she said um that having having more women on the setting team obviously brings in a different clientele. And I think that whenever we had, uh, you know, extra women on the team setting, uh, clients came in and noticed instantly. Um, When the big initiative was happening, obviously people noticed, aside from the giant flag that we had, people still like (laughs) right away, they didn't have to ask any questions about what we were doing. It was clearly, and and it was, uh, and it was, it really brought in like people came. There are some women who and pe- individuals who were like maybe stronger in a, a different style of, of climbing who came and tried those boulders specifically because it 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 it, it was appealing to them to try something new. Um, so yeah, I think that like just focusing on on that with a, with a potential employer talking, you know, having a uh, trying to. Uh, have a conversation that is ongoing and making it known, like speak up, <laughs> like make it known that you want to set, make it known that, you know, you want to try for running and that you want to be a part of the team, but making sure that not to wait for someone to come get you, because that's definitely not what other people are doing. Like you have to go and, and talk about it yourself. So <laughs> put yourself out there. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you ran four clinics that were for like beginner clinics. Um, mm-hmm. Let's say like about 10, 10-ish people each. I'm not really sure what the numbers were, but how? Eight. Oh, okay, gotcha. So, so we're looking at what, like 32-ish graduates of, of this program from the first season. What's your feedback? Because I know you, you keep in touch and I think you have a Facebook group and, and you guys have kind of like a long-term holistic approach to making sure that women stay connected and, <laughs> and uh, uh, empowered in the industry. So what have you been hearing back? Like, are, are any of them finding jobs? Are any of them, maybe they've realized, you know, I don't want to do this, but now I've got this appreciation for it. But uh, a year later, basically, what's the, you know, what's the, uh, like, I, I don't want to say success rate, but how'd it go? Let's just say, how did it go for these women that took part? Um, uh, there are quite a few, like, uh, some women from the beginner workshop found jobs in the, I think for sure. Uh, well, I don't know exact numbers, but uh, again, like it's hard to keep constant contact, but I know at least two or three are, are working. Um, and then others have uh, gotten opportunities in gyms that do exchanges um, for, for like a membership. So already that's really great because it's an opportunity to work on the skills that they, you know, that they learn. Um and because a one workshop alone is not enough necessarily to get someone a, a, a work, but it's it's at least like we said, like a. So um, I think that uh, some some don't work in in root setting and maybe haven't have realized that it's not something that they want to do. But um, many of them, many of the women still talk about the workshop like in their in their social media and like when we announced, I like, talked about what a positive experience it was in terms of just having the discussion surrounding their their various experiences in climbing in the climbing world um and how they go about life in a gym etc and and um and also just learning more i think ultimately about movement and what happens in the root setting process and and how that contributes to their their climbing you know and, and how they look at a boulder ultimately um, but there are women who, who, who are working, uh, more and it, for, in, in the advanced workshop, I would say that I think it's confirmed to a few women that they really want to, this is definitely something they want to push further. So, um, and like potentially set at nationals or set, you know, at higher level comps, um, and work more hours at it. So I think it's been, it's been, it's been interesting and, and really, um, confirming that that like there's a need for, <laughs> for what we're doing here. So. so for for next year now that you've had a season to learn from it um i mean given that we don't really know when the next se- session <laughs> yeah. is going to be but there will be another one eventually um that's just sad thinking about uh 
But, uh, you know, after you guys must have debriefed, and I'm sure you started talking about planning and stuff because you had dates and you were ready to go and stuff. But uh, uh, on, on a practical level, uh, in the running of the clinics, was there anything that you guys were uh, looking to change or improve on that really stood out? It's like, oh, we didn't really have our stuff together for that or our expectations of how this went uh, were a little bit off. Um, what did you come back at uh, for, uh, for this coming season that might be different? Um, I think that more uh, better defining what the advanced workshops were going to be, like the topics for the advanced workshops was one of them. Um, just uh, because we realized like they did, the, the women didn't come in with a certain amount of knowledge so we could be more specific and targeted in the, in the teaching. Beginner, I think, I, to me, it wasn't perfect, but there's, um, it was, there's not like huge improvements we needed to, to, to make. We wanted, we did want to maybe start teaching on ropes. This we, we were going to set up two now again, like we'll, we'll see what happens <laughs> in the fall. But Flynn, did you want to add to <laughs> Yeah. In terms of um, curriculum, nothing really stood out to me in the Vienna workshops as well. This was a really big hole that we needed to cover. Um, there are a couple of hiccups with like finding gear and drills and stuff, which are, you know, that's like definitely on our to-do list. But um, yeah, definitely looking forward to having more specific advanced workshops. So having like a, a commercial setting advanced workshop and then a competition setting advanced workshop. Other than that, they went pretty well. Yeah. Pretty good. I, I did want to, can I just add something? <laughs> I did want to add that uh, in terms of the workshops, um, it, I think, yeah, we'll add like these you know, better definition, et cetera, of like the curriculum for the advanced. But the, um, I think it's the post workshop follow-ups that we want to be even better with. So maybe try to connect, try to be a more part of connecting the participants to um, like apprenticeships or internships opportunities with gyms. Uh, that's, um, that's going to be a really key factor to seeing higher numbers of success uh, again in, 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 the uh, in, like the development of the, the root setters after the workshop uh, and ensuring that like we start to see a higher level of like a higher number of women and uh, non-binary root setters in the, in the workforce. So. Okay, I'm trying to keep a close eye on the time, but I, I wanted to get to uh, kind of the idea of advancing uh, women and non-binary setters through being comp setters, chiefing events, uh, you know, running teams. Uh, and the the CEC earlier this year, um, I don't really know what to call it, kind of like a proclamation, but they, they effectively said that they were working towards uh, trying to get a female national chief uh, in Canada, which has never been done before. Um, and I mean, setting in, in Canada, we can like name all five national chiefs and it's the same <laughs> guys every year and, and they're good setters. But, uh, but, you know, when we start looking at who starts managing a crew, who's setting at comps, a lot of that comes down to connections. So knowing your other setters, but it also does come down a lot to who is running the event. And it comes down to gym owners and kind of a circle of reputation um, and people that are willing to fight for you and, and go to the CEC and say, hey, this guy has been busting his balls. We want to get him as one of the national chiefs or in this case, uh, this woman or um, so. First of all, I, I wanted to know your thoughts on the idea of of, uh, of trying to get a national chief in Canada, because I, I don't want to paint the picture from this conversation that thanks to the big initiative, we now have 10 female setters in Canada. There are lots of, of excellent female setters. Uh, um, but how far away do you think we are from that? And is it is it really that far away at all? Isn't it just like, hey, there are some excellent setters. Now we're just going to hire one as the national chief? Because I feel in a lot of cases, that's really it. Is literally just to like, oh yeah, they're great. They're achieving now. Yeah. I don't think we're very far. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that, um, so there are a few things. So one is that we would talk, we spoke earlier about failing, you know, and making mistakes. And I think that this is one thing that I've heard a lot from both women who work in the industry and women uh, in root setting and women who are like trying to get into root setting um, is being given opportunities to fail. And um, recently I went to climb at uh, Somerville, uh, Brooklyn Boulders in Somerville, I had a comp that was completely like set all by women. And um, I thought it was really excellent because all these women could practice setting a comp without it and, and make mistakes in the comp and, and it wouldn't affect 
whether or not they would get hired in another comp in the future because I find that uh, I've seen in the past, you know, potentially like a setter make mistakes or like have a less successful competition setting experience. And uh, we've seen that, we've seen that happen multiple times. And I find that often the guys don't have to worry about, you know, they'll, they'll set another comp, they'll get hired again for something else. And potentially if that happens to a woman, there's a chance, you know, it's like, well, she, you know, she's lacking experience. She wasn't great. Or, you know, there's like implicit bias, I think, that comes with that. And I don't want to say it's like that across the board. You know, it's, it's always touching making these declarations. Um, but hiring, making a, del- when we're talking about deliberate action earlier, I think it, it is, you know, we wonder how we do it. How do we hire women? Well, we just hire them. Ultimately, that's the, that's the goal is like just hire her and then and then train her and give her an opportunity to learn and and to make mistakes and because you know she she can't build herself a she can't build herself uh like an uh an experience or she can't build her portfolio if she doesn't get multiple opportunities to to do that um and i spoke with the cc and i'm i'm on board you know i think that uh, a declaration like that or a proclamation or like a decision that they make like that is really key because it's the, you're right. It comes down to the gyms and the experience that each gym gives to his, you know, their own setters. And, but if the CC is saying, Hey guys, we want to do this. We want to have a female chief setter for Nash at the national level. Then the gyms will say, Hey, you know, maybe I want my, I want it to be the woman who works for our gym or the, you know, the, the person who works for our gym. So the, I think there would be potentially a bigger investment on the gym's part to develop that. When we're talking about like investing in a person, developing a person, um, that's, I think, I think it has to go through all levels of, uh, of everyone that's involved in, in our circuits. And so, yeah. Fine. <laughs> yeah. I think it's, it's, it can't just be just like a bottom up initiative and it can't be a top down initiative. It's gotta be, like and absolutely across the board, everyone's working to to further this goal. So it's one thing to have these beginner clinics, and it's another thing to have the CEC um, say that they want to have a female chief. Um, but things need to be enacted for that, right? So one idea that comes to mind, or one thing that comes to mind, is the IFSC's development program, um, which is a thing that I'm lucky enough to be a part of. But where they they're like basically taking an affirmative action plan to hire more women. So offering women internships at high level comps um, that they might not necessarily have qualified for through the traditional rungs of like the route setting ladder, but that they are qualified for in terms of like experience and ability. Um, Yeah, just taking taking all these like risks and then hopefully like rewards Mm -hmm. for for hiring women for those higher levels and like letting letting people have multiple chances, letting people have a bad comp followed by a good comp. and like letting all that build a build a career. I, I wanted to touch on that because you talk about that, you know, uh, Jean-Pierre, you mentioned that like for, for men, they're not worried about if they're going to set another comp, like they're, they're going to set another comp. Whereas when hiring uh, maybe a woman in that same position, you there's almost like this overthinking of like, God, do they have like, can they, you know, can they handle it? Can they balance the crew? All this kind of stuff. Um, and Flannery talking about the IFSC is we know that there are like some of the best setters in the world can have a terrible comp, right? Um, and that's balanced it out by the fact that it's a crew and not just one person. But we see that all the time where you have excellent roots setters can have a bad comp and everybody talks about it for a day or whatever uh, but they're absolutely going to be back um what's what's your your experience having set for a lot of competitions and some fairly high level ones um what's what's your uh kind of mindset around that idea of of being known as a good setter but still possibly always failing so i shouldn't say always there's always the possibility of, <laughs> sorry, that makes, it, that makes it sound like you've got like a terrible track record. Uh, but no, uh, you, you've, always, you've always got a chance where things just don't work out and that doesn't take away from the fact that you're good at this. Um, but you know, it's, it's just one of those extremely difficult jobs. So just talk to me a bit about that. Yeah, I think um, it's kind of twofold. Like it is a really difficult job to succeed at because even in the best case scenario, we're just kind of rolling the dice. We're trying to make like educated decisions under conditions of uncertainty at every turn, right? So having a good comp is, is just as just as much a chance of luck or like a 
just as much luck as having a bad comp a lot of days. Um, but that's where that implicit bias comes in. It's like there's no reason that women should be worse at, at luck than men should, basically. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it just like comes down to like giving people more chances and giving people chances just repeatedly and giving like women more chances across the board. Uh, we're heading towards the end of our time, so uh, I'm going to throw it, Jean Viet, for uh, to you for the for the last of it. Can you just talk about if people are interested in learning more or what it takes to be involved in this? How much does it cost? What do you need? All that kind of stuff. Do you want to give a quick like kind of rundown? You mean as the participant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the we give all of our workshops for free. Uh, you have to apply. Uh, there's an application process uh, that is on our website at thebiginitiative.ca. Um, there are, you know, criteria as to apply, but ultimately, if you want to be a part of the workshop, if you want a chance, then you just have to apply. I think that, um, there's, there's a, that we've heard back last year, we heard back from people who did get taken, who almost didn't apply because they were worried about being turned down. And, and often, you know, we do have a lot of, we do have many applicants, but I think, um, we go through a blind uh, reading process so I don't look at any of the names on the list and we go we like read their actual applications and that's how we make our selections so um just just apply <laughs> we just uh it, again it's you know we want to do this to take away the barriers to entry for women and uh, non-binary setters so um we we don't lower the bar we just want people to apply so that they like see and feel and go through the process of thinking about it and and uh um and uh, you don't have to climb v10 or v13 to to apply <laughs> you just you have to climb <laughs> and apply <laughs> and tell us about yourself and your experience in climbing so. cool Awesome. All right. Well, thank you both very much. Uh, if you're interested in following either Jean Pierre or Flannery, they've got their Instagram handles down at the bottom. I don't know how active they are, but for whatever reason, I just put those up anyway. So you just got to deal with the onslaught of new followers. Uh, if yeah. you if you enjoyed this episode, make sure you subscribe to Plastic Weekly. And if you want to support it, you can uh, hop on the Patreon. And if you just want to talk about climbing with a bunch of other people, I like nerding out about stuff like uh, belay lessons and all that kind of thing. Uh, join the Discord as well. Um, other than that, well, I guess we'll just call it there. Thanks again, uh, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Perfect. Thanks. Bye.